people can change anything they want to. And that means everything in the world. Show me any country and there'll be people in it. It's time to take the humanity back into the center of the ring and follow that for a time. You know, think on that. Without people, you're nothing. Without people, you're nothing. Stoke the fire. Cheers, dude. Good to see you, as always. <laughs> you too, You're right. You dying on me? I got a little smoke in my lungs. I started my day off with a nice big fire. So, I'm just doing some some product placement some, for some, those some, who are watching. We are not above product placement. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne's world, Wayne's world. Yeah, Probably exactly. Just... So what have you been choking on? Go again. Uh, yeah, so I, I woke up this morning and decided I'm going to light a big fire in my backyard and wake up and have my morning tea by a roaring fire. And that's what I did. So uh, Purple and I were just sitting by the fire for about an hour and a half with one of our cats just starting the day. It was awesome. That's why you've carried the flames into the indoor yeah. facility and you've got candles lit because usually they're not lit. I'm noticing that. This is a new That's, thing. That's Well, th this has been a constant now uh, the past two weeks writing and getting inspired instead of having the natural lights on, which I do have this on now, but I've been writing by candlelight uh, lyrics and stuff. So it's actually helped the vibe. I enjoy it. I'll bet. Well, we, we like candles in the pub that I work at. And there's a guy who comes in not every day, but you know, often, and he'll be reading and I'll sort of come around to dim the lights and light the candles. And he gets really annoyed because he's like, well, I can't really read anymore because it's too dark. I'm like, yeah, but you know, it's the vibe. I'm not going to change the vibe just for you, mate. So on your butt. No, you can stay actually. I'll allow it, but it's not all about you. <laughs> Holy shit. Get a Should little I wear headlamp. these? Should I wear these? I've, I've kind of got a few of these zoom meetings lined up today and I'm conscious as you do a lot of them in a row of of the blue light. So I've got my blue blocker glasses, but do I look like a nerd if I wear them? Well, the only thing is you get that white circle that's reflecting off hardcore on you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, we'll leave them then. We'll leave yeah, you them. Gonna, you got a handsome face. Don't hide under your glasses. Well, very kind of you to say, Jesse Leach. Um, <laughs> should we get this week's guest on the show? Yeah. Enough, enough waxing and waning. Let's get to it, brother. So at the end of last year, I went on the Kiss Cruise, as we've spoke about a couple of times over on Patreon. I haven't really discussed it that much over here because I don't want to keep going on about it. But it was a highlight of my life, uh, a great honor to be asked to go out there and, and host the Q&As and, and do a little DJ set. And it was a strange um, experience because the other cruises that I've done, the the demographic is a lot younger. So there wasn't that many people on the Kiss Cruise that I kind of spoke with and hung out with because everybody was kind of a bit older and I was working. So I kind of just kept myself to myself. But there was one person on there who I, I didn't spend a lot of time with, but I'd bump into her, you know, at various points throughout the week and kept seeing her around. And we, we had a brief chat and there was a moment, the moment that I think kind of solidified the fact that I wanted to be friends with this person and, and wanted to, you know, get her on the show and, and she's on the show now. But Paul Stanley was doing a kind of very informal Q&A on his own. He was just sat down on the stage taking questions from the crowd, really loose, really kind of just um, personable. And it was quite amazing how accessible he made himself. And this lady, Brittany, who's going to be joining us in a minute, she, I'll get her to tell the story, but she kind of, it was more of a comment than a question, but she said to Paul that the reason she was a tattoo artist, which she is, is because her mum had gone out and gotten the same tattoo as Paul Stanley because she was a big Kiss fan. And so all these you know, years later, her being a tattoo artist is kind of a direct result of the impact that Paul and Kiss had had on her mum. And she mentioned that her mum was no longer with us. And it was just like a really tender, poignant moment that made me think like, wow, there's, you know, there's, there's a light around this person. She seems like a really cool human being. And so uh, we, you know, got each other's Instagram details, have remained in touch, and and now she's joining us on the show. So excited to kind of hear all about her story and her journey. Um, so without further ado, let's get her on. Brittany Elliott, tattoo artist, table maker, legend, um, loose friend from the Kiss Cruise. Brittany, come on and join us here on Stoke the Fire. There's hey, guys. By magic. Hello, hello. Hello. I raised my skull goblet too. Welcome. That's amazing. As, as is you. as is the background there. So Thank before you. we go any further, let's just give a name check to your podcast, which I can see perfectly product placed in the background, The Haunted Chapel, which you do with your partner, John. Uh, I was checking out a few episodes on YouTube earlier. Great fun. Um, obviously, the, the pair of you very much in this world of rock and roll. Lots of stories. 
uh, and I'm sure we'll get into a few of them here today. But yeah, thank you for for taking the time to join us, and I'm really excited of to course. pick your brain and hear your stories. I'm honored to be here. Thank you guys so much for asking me. This is so cool. Yeah, Jesse. I gotta say right, right off the bat, I gotta say um, the the tables are so cool. Uh, you know, I'm not really a guy that has stuff. Um, my lady purple, my partner <laughs> purple does. She likes stuff. And my best friend Jeff owns a bar called Lucky 13 in Brooklyn. And he is the guy. Like he's got all that kind of stuff. Memorabilia, his his apartment and his bar just filled with that stuff. And I love it. It's such a cool thing. And it's it's a culture, really. Like rock and roll is a culture. And I love that yep. you guys seem to really embody that. And it's a really good vibe. But those tables, man, the Alice in Chains one with the chains around it. I was like, yo, that's, <laughs> that's badass. Dude, it's funny because I almost I was like, what shirt do I wear? I was like, do I what which one of my favorite bands do I wear? And I'm like, Alice, of course. And I'm like, man, I always wear Alice. And I'm like, I'm going to wear something not black for once in my life. There but I was I had Alice on the brain. But I made that for myself. And it's funny because a lot of these tables I have made for myself. And then I have somebody that's just like, dude, I have to have it. And I'm like, well, I make them. I can try to make another one, even though all of them are original posters and mostly stuff that I'd had since I was a kid because I've been that's collecting so cool. since I was young. Um, but like I'll get a custom order for something. Maybe I don't have it. I'll order an OG poster. But yeah, that that Alice one really, that was, that was hard to get rid of. Yeah, I can't even imagine, dude. It's cool that you make them for yourself, though. That's awesome. I like yeah, that. Yeah, that's that's how it started. Is I just started making stuff for my house, and I've always like seen beauty and and older stuff. You know, I grew up pretty pretty poor. My dad was. Uh, the, I had two brothers, three kids, and single income family. My dad was single dad and working class electrician, and so we we went thrifting a lot, and I loved it. I loved turning trash into treasure or like turning something that someone might throw on the side of the road. And like, I just have the eye, like I'll see something and be like, oh my God, I can make that so cool. I could replace the knob on that and sand it down and just make it killer. And people trip out after they see that, you know, the before and after product. And that really like, I just love before and afters, like weight loss stories, just any type of before and after I think is so cool, just transformations. So yeah. I really got addicted to making these tables. So yeah, well, that, and, cool. then, and then and it's one of a kind, really. You know, that's what I love yes. about thrifting or antique shopping. Because where I live up here in Woodstock, New York, there's antique shops everywhere, and you never know when you walk in, you might find something completely unique. There's a yep. story to it. Yeah, it's a real art form to that kind of stuff. Dig it. Yeah, I have too much stuff, so I can <laughs> share the love and send you some, or send your girl some. <laughs> oh, I'm, yeah. a, I'm a I'm a rock and roll hoarder. <laughs> Could be well, worse. You seem to put in a lot of time and effort you know, into these restorations as well. It's not just like you kind of do a little bit, like, you know, mm -hmm. get a table, put a poster on top, cover it up. Like, it seems like you spend weeks on each yeah. item. Is that safe to say? Yeah, for sure. And it's tough because I have a full-time tattoo schedule as well. And so, you know, and I only have so much daylight and, and now it's like, you have less daylight in this next six months or whatever here. And so I'm just, I'm trying to get as much sanding and prepping and stuff done before I go to the tattoo shop. And I'm just kind of all over the place. I'm constantly creating. Um, I'm not real. I've never been the type to sit down and watch TV. Like my brain's just on overload all the time. And um, I'm just always thinking of like, what can I make? What can I create? You know? And so I'm, I'm rarely said, Terry until I'm just out of gas at the end of the day and then I'm like okay it's time to go to bed and start again but yeah they they take me weeks like the one I made for Jesse James uh just last month I like obsessed over it to the point where like I was I was so stressed because I'm like oh my gosh it's Jesse James like the king of detail the king of fabrication like has had all these tv shows about his craftsmanship and he reached out to me and asked me for a custom piece for his wife and I was just like wow so I I mean I bought two identical tables. Okay, I'm going to tell you all how crazy I am. Identical tables, mid-century, like beautiful pieces, like pieces of wood, but they were covered in varnish, right? And so I was like, man, I could just like give these a light sanding and spray paint them and douse them. So I did that with the first one, but it had this beautiful like brass inlay. And I realized like I had cleaned out the brass and stuff like in between the little like they look like light rays. I cleaned it all out like with, um, you know, stripper and stuff like that and spray painted it. But I was like, man, this isn't good enough. Like I could see little like particles of dust that had gotten caked with spray paint from, you know, dust from the 1960s that I didn't get out of there. And I was like, man, I've got to take this second table apart and completely start from scratch. So I, I, I worked on one for like three weeks for Jesse and I was like about to lay the poster down and I was like, it's not good enough. You, there's too many flaws in this table. So I completely started over and scrapped like over 50 hours of work, but I don't care about 
money, you know, like um, easy come, easy go. I've never really had money. I've always just kind of made enough to keep a roof over my head and live the life I want to live and just buy records and survive, right? But my work is like, my name's on that, dude. And like my dad taught me like, stay proud, stay humble, but stay true to your work and don't ever, um, don't ever do a half-assed job, basically. Like he just super took pride in his electrical work. Like, I mean, he would bend these wires and he'd have like rainbow wires and they'd be going into perfect. He's like, man, nobody does that. That's why I'm the king and all this, you know, and that's why he got hired for all these badass jobs. And that's why I'm having Jesse James look at my stuff because I put all these meticulous hours and blood, sweat, and tears and TLC into stuff where most people tell me, oh, I could just make that myself. I just pour resin on a table and I'm like, okay, go ahead. You know, you, you know, try that. And mm. then they come to me and they're like, yeah, that wasn't as easy as I thought, or it doesn't look the same, but that's, it's the art of trial and error and taking pride in your work. You know, I, I think the the thing that's ringing to me is passion. It's, it's something passion. that you care very much about. And I think yes. a, any artist, at least from, from my dealings, any artist who's got that passion, that drive, they're, product their music their writing whatever comes out better it it hits better it hits different you know there are i know some artists that don't really have to practice their craft i'm a little jealous of that because for me <laughs> right for me it takes me a long time for anything to do anything almost Same. probably too much time um but you know i'm that's everybody's different and i love the passion i love it that's what it's all right. about if you're and, gonna do and... something do it right yeah. And I'll find myself, I don't, I've spoken to, um, I don't know, I'm not like super into astrology or anything, but I have a, a close friend that's like a mentor to me. He's uh, older. He's kind of like an uncle that's, he's a sign painter and he's done all the signs for all my shops. Um, his name's Mike Belzell. He's really cool, super wise, but, um, he just says, man, keep your hands, keep your hands moving, keep the passion and screw money. Money will come in the end, you know, like just get your work out there, keep your work out there. And he'll see me like slave over something and be like, I hate it. And he's like, man, it's, it's good to care. But at the end of the day, you know, um, don't beat yourself up over it, but je definitely take pride in your work. And I definitely do. I was going somewhere with that story. I, I lost my train of thought, but, um, he's really helped me just realize that you just have to put, put all of yourself into your work and then you know, then your peaceful shine. Or if, if you, if you're not feeling it, just, uh, Oh, my point was, um, like he and I, we're both Leos and our, our birthdays are like two days apart. And so he's like, man, I'll sit around and I'll obsess over something in my head for like a week. And then once I'm like, I'm not ready to like bring the table to fruition or for him, it's a sign or whatever. And, but like, I'll think about it and think about it. And I'll like obsess over it in my brain while I'm tattooing or whatever, like thinking about this table, like how, what color am I going to do this next giveaway? Like blah, blah, blah. And I'm obsessing over it. And by the time I go to do it, it comes like that, you know, it's super mm -hmm. easy. But um, if I sit down and I'm just like, if it's forced, like, especially with tattooing, like I find myself nowadays, people have the internet, which kind of sucks for tattooers because it's great for referencing, but it sucks for us in the sense that a customer will come to you with 40 ideas. And they're like, I want all of these different things in this one tattoo. And it does, and you're just like, ah, and you're trying to make them happy, but then it becomes a job. It's not <laughs> It's not fun anymore, you know, because you're trying, like, you have to print out 20 pieces of paper and try to make all of these things work together. And most of the time they don't, you know? And so, um, anyway, the creative process is, is more fun for me and tables a lot of the time, because I can really just go crazy and just like, um, just paint and just create something truly cool and one of a kind, whereas tattooing has a lot of parameters around it and you're, you're pleasing somebody else. Whereas with the tables, I'm more like pleasing myself. And then people are like, oh, I want that, you know? So if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you about your parents because it seems like both of them had a big impact on you. Uh, but you mentioned your dad was kind of raising you on your own. So yes. if you don't mind going into it, where do the parents split and, and, you know, begin to kind of, I guess, be on a different path in life, but you're still assumedly connected with both of them and have a good relationship with both of them. Yeah. So both, both of my parents are deceased. I'm 35. So that's pretty young to have lost both your parents, um, which has been really tough. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to try not to get all emo, but, um, so I lost my mom when I was 25 and, um, my parents split up, divorced when I was three. I have one older brother that's four years older and he'll be 40 next week on Wednesday. And so I'm 35, I'll be 36 this year. So it's just been, and I my older brother and I, and then, um, our parents got separated 
we were kind of in limbo, lived with our grandma for a year when I was five. And then um, my mom got custody briefly. Then my dad got custody because my mom, um, my mom was an addict. My mom went through nursing school and then she got all these doctors to fill her up with whatever big pharma drugs that she wanted. And um, she got addicted to painkillers. And that was early in my life. Like I was very young going to visit my mom in and out of rehabs and um, just going to all these group therapies and not really just thinking that was normal, you know, like from an early, early age, like eight years old, maybe, maybe younger. Is this all in Texas? Where you where uh-huh. you now live? So you grew up in Texas, yeah. Yeah, so I did. I, that was on here in in San Antonio, but my mom would be like an hour or two away in a rehab. Like this would be like at least once a year. Then he'd, she'd like get her shit together for a year, and then she'd meet a guy at AA, or she'd meet a guy in rehab, and then she'd get strung out again. Long story short, my mom OD'd on fentanyl patches that were prescribed by her doctor when I was twenty five. So it's like I lived that addict shit my whole childhood right and uh sorry it's it's tough to talk about but um so my mom passed and that was really tough but my when my mom we kind of always expected it but never did and it's like I, I really had this like love affair with my mom my mom was never around she was always in and out of my, our lives you know but um I had this love affair of wanting her in my life you know and she was a really sweet kind person when I saw her we just never saw her you know and so we were raised by our dad. My dad was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to raise my kids. I had these two kids and I love them to death. And I'm just going to pick up, you know, and be two parents. So my dad was the greatest, um, super rock and roll soul, hard rock seventies guy. Uh, we were raised on Van Halen and Montrose and Moxie and triumph and just really like deep cut 70s stuff. We were just always listening to records. Music was always on my house. Um, so didn't really see my mom much, but I just, I idolized my dad. And then my dad met this um, woman when I was like six, seven or six years old. Um, and they had my younger brother, Michael. So Michael was born in 94. They were married for 10 years. And then my stepmom left and she took Mike and um, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, um, I started tattooing when I was like 18. Michael w- was living in Oklahoma with his mom, my stepmother at the time. Basically, like my my childhood was just crazy. Um, my stepmom, she, I think, resented the fact that she married my dad. And then he got like, he got custody of us like right after they got married. And she was kind of like, these aren't my kids. You know what I mean? But he's like, hey, th- my kids have an addict mom and these are my babies, you know? And so I kind of had a rough childhood with my stepmom and then um, that led to my stepmom and my dad getting divorced because she and I and my older brother and her didn't really get along. So she took my little brother and my little brother was murdered um, in Oklahoma. Um, so it's kind of like, I try not to blame her for that, but I, I wonder like what would have happened had she not taken him? And so that just happened. I, that's two years ago. I think it's like, it's a blur. Like my dad died in 2019. My brother was murdered 20, um, 2020. Oh, this is already really recent. Yes. Yes. So that's why I'm kind of like, ah, I get choked up. So yeah. So my brother was, um, I guess like at a house party or something and one of his friends killed him and nobody will fess up. So it's like this huge homicide investigation. Like, yeah. So that's been like really, really heavy. And that happened. Like our dad died, like November, 2019, Mike came down from Oklahoma We were planning the funeral and stuff and um, he just wasn't well. I could tell he was just really depressed and he still has his mom, my ex stepmom. And um, so he, that was his first heavy loss. Right. And so I had already been through losing my mom. So, you know, I was trying to help him through that. And he's like, I just got to go home and be with my girl. I'm like, okay, I'm here for you, Mike. You know, I'm, I'm your sister. We really just have each other, me and my brothers. And so um, he went back up there and I never saw him again. So he got like super strung out on drugs and started just, you know, hanging out with kids that sucked and someone killed him. And so then, uh, you know, COVID's going on. My shop gets shut down. Johnny uh, is Tom Mariah's brother. I don't know if y'all know that. So he's um, he was Slayer's first roadie ever and last roadie. So he's been with Tom and Slayer since he was 15 years old. And um, so he was out of work because Slayer retired. And Tom just kind of does his own thing with his family and the crew didn't get anything. They're like, you're responsible for your own retirement. And Johnny's kind of like, what? Like, that's all I've ever known is touring and just kind of blindsided by that. My dad died. My brother died. I'm like 
the sole breadwinner, but I'm so fucked up with grief that I'm like, oh my God, baby, like I can't work. And so we've been like scrambling for a couple of years to pick up the pieces. And, you know, I just really try to stay positive. And um, I feel like tattooing and like making all this stuff, like it fuels me, you know, like being creative is what fuels me. And then um, I have all these really cool opportunities, like you guys wanting to talk to me and like uh, six men reaching out to me going, we want you to work the Kiss Cruises. You love Kiss. And, you know, just really cool things like that from just like being 100% rock and roll all the time just I've always been 100% rock and roll I owned a heavy metal shop with my ex so I don't I don't really want to promote the name or talk about that but that was a part of my life people that know know but we had a heavy metal shop and tattoo shop that was like the first of its kind and then um we didn't see eye to eye um business wise and so we we parted ways but then it was a total blessing that was 18 because I 2018 I met Johnny and he's like the most beautiful soul in the world and he's so kind and he's been through so much like I have and it's like I met him am I talking too much I'm talking no 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 no, okay okay so um just real quick so I met Johnny it was like (laughs) all this I'm sorry I'm I'm I have a lot to say but um that's why yeah that's why you're here Brittany (laughs) awesome we're here to listen yes okay awesome this rocks this is like free counseling I love it (laughs) that's kind of what this show is all about for us too yeah for us too (laughs) yes heavy metal counseling so um so yeah all this like fucked up shit happened in my life like uh so my mom died in 2012 and then um I said, fuck it. Like, I'm just going to, you know, do whatever I want. And I got approached by a TV show at a ta- I was working at a tattoo convention and I went on this, sh- I worked, moved to Hollywood for a while. And I went on the show, Best Inc. Cause my mom told me you got to do this show, you know, or you got to, something's going to come to you in your life soon and you've got to take it. You got to take a risk. So I'm getting off topic, but, um, my mom died immediately after that. So I took the chance, went to Hollywood. Um, as soon as I got back from that, I wound up moving to Fort Worth. I met my ex and we started the shop. It was great. But in 2018 parted ways. And then I was like, I don't know what to do with my life. Like that was my dream to have a heavy metal record store and tattoo shop, like encompassed everything that I love. Like I had collected so much stuff throughout my life that I wanted to make this shop. Right. Fell apart. Didn't work out. And I'm like, what do I do with my life? I come down here my brother's strung out on drugs. My dad's, you know, not well. And then I'm like, oh my God, I got to move home. So I moved home. I get an email uh, from Johnny Araya um, and at whatever.com. And I'm like, Johnny Araya. And I check and he's like, hi, I'm coming through town. These dates, uh, this date and this date, I would love to get a tattoo from you. Um, John Araya Slayer crew. And I'm like, what the hell? So I respond and I'm like, wait, is this the Johnny Araya? And he's like, uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> you know? And so we go back and forth a little bit and he's like, I really want to get uh, my first Slayer tattoo. I've worked for my brother's band my whole life. And I'm like, Oh my God, it's really Johnny. How cool. He's like, I'd love to um, get tattooed by you. If you come out to any show, just let me know. And if you could bring your gear, I'll pay you for your time. Like, cool. So I wound up flying out to um, a couple shows and he didn't have time the first couple of days. I tattooed um, a couple other like road crew people and um, just got this really awesome vibe from him. And, uh, he, it was like, we were like, kind of like when I met you, Matt, it was just kind of like, what's up? Like, like you just feel like you like know this person, you know? And it's like, kind of like you, you're like meant to be friends, like immediate, like, uh, just like form an immediate from friendship, you know? And so, um, anyway, like a month goes by or so, and Johnny starts, um, texting me like, Hey, I want to come get tattooed again. Uh, in a couple months, I want to come back to Texas. So he came here and he was like, man, I've been wanting to move to Texas and I really like you. And I was like, I really like you too. And we both were single and it just was like this magical, like, I was like, I'm not going to be in a relationship. I'm going to do my own thing and figure my stuff out. We met, he immediately went on the last Slayer tour. My dad died. And so he, my dad died when he was on the road. And so it was like, Oh my God. But had I not met Johnny, I would have, I would have had no support system. My older brother's there for me, but he's very, he's very, very Christian in the sense that he's like, dad's okay. Now he's with God, you know, whereas I'm like, I never see dad again, you know, and I'm just like melting at the thought of not being able to call him and, you know, having all this grief, whereas my brother doesn't carry grief. Like I do. He's like, he's well now, you know, and it's kind of like, so anyway, long story short, both my parents are deceased. My brother was murdered, so I've had a very traumatic family life. I don't really have much family. So I have Johnny, and I have my friends, and I have music. And I think music and creating is what keeps me strong. And I do have days where I wake up, and I'm just, like, sad AF, and I don't want to get out of bed, and I don't feel like I have the energy to give my clients. Um, But 
I'm so grateful for tattooing and grateful for my clients because I'll feel that way. And then I'll go tattoo someone and they just look in the mirror and they look so proud and, and I fill them up and they fill me up throughout the session of talking and hanging out. There's just this beautiful um, energy exchange and I leave a lasting impression on them and vice versa. And so I feel like in a way that's my gift to humanity and vice versa is being able like almost like counseling, but like healing people in a way through tattooing, you know? I knew I was right about you. I knew there was something special and I had oh. no, I, I had no idea about all of that recent trauma. Um, and the fact that you've come through that with the help of a wonderful partner and just shine so much brightness and light into the world is nothing short of incredible. Isn't it Jesse? Thank you guys. Yeah, I have a lot to say. Um, I'll try to keep it fairly simple, though. Number one, I want to say there's a, a a light and a strength that emanates from you. I'm a fairly sensitive, empathetic person. Um, and all the things you just dropped, all the things that you've been through, your your backstory. That was a lot. I'm sorry. No, no, do not apologize for that. That's what why we do. That's why we do this podcast. That's why this podcast was started during the pandemic. Was to find a sense of purpose because Matt and I are very much that way. We need reciprocal energy from humans, yes. whether that be from my music, which clearly during the pandemic I was not doing. Um, back to my point though, it's, I enjoy meeting and hearing stories like yours and, and being able to connect. I mean, obviously it's zoom. We're not in the same room, but you, your spirit, you put off, um, it's easy going, even though you just dropped all those heavy things. It seems to me there's an inner strength within you that's very obvious um, and you still have a, a light about you. So Thank I think you. that speaks volumes of your character. Um, and yeah, that's a lot to unpack, a lot of loss. And I, I think with yeah. loss, loss really shapes people and it, it either can destroy you or, or push you to continue to, to be something that gives back. You know, I think people who have dealt with a lot of loss, I think of my my lady purple who's comes from a crazy crazy background with loss and drug addiction and all that stuff. She's one of those people that she'll do anything to help people. And right. I love that spirit of people who've been through it and instead of mimicking the path or you know getting into drugs or or you know furthering down the the, the darkness they s turn around and they want to just bring the light to people. And I can see that you're that type of person and it's really cool you get to do that through your tattooing. Uh, cause tattooing is a very beautiful thing. Everything that I have, even my crappy tattoos, they remind me of a, a time in my life. And it is, I, I love that you mentioned you get to tattoo people to heal them when in fact you're, you know, inflicting Hurting like them. actual, like, <laughs> no, but that's, but that's, I think that's beautiful. Cause I think tattoos do heal. They do. Mm -hmm. They signify, uh, you know, the inner, the inner you is shown outside and you don't have to say a word. And I love that about right. tattoos. Um, yeah, it sounds like a hell of a journey. And I think that's, first of all, it's beautiful that you have now have somebody by your side that gets it and you're yes. able to ride through the pandemic, especially through that pandemic together. That was huge for me as well. In my relationship, I had met purple before the pandemic, but when the pandemic hit, that was like, you want to put a fast forward on a relationship, especially yeah. if, especially a guy who tours like me and, and like, uh, your man does to pull us off the road and put us in a situation where we can't do what we do that makes us who we are. That's a true testament to you, who you are. And then how is, is a relationship going to last through that? And the fact exactly. that it did is beautiful. So I love your story. It's heavy. I think we can definitely get into details, but overall, just, I commend you and your strength. Thank and you. it's awesome to, to meet people who take what life has given them, even the dark stuff and you just make it work and you keep pushing forward and giving of your spirit, regardless of the pain that you've experienced. I love that. For sure. It, like I said, it's tough, but it's, um, it's what makes me feel good. And I like, as crappy as I might feel, I want to shine light on someone else. And, um, I think Robin Williams says something like that, you know, like you, you give like as crappy as you feel inside, you still want to make someone else feel good. So that's, that's just the type of person I've always been since I was a kid. There's home videos of me just being a little ham and just trying to make people happy and make people smile. And I've just always been the same, same exact person, but, and it, it weirds me out when people aren't reciprocal or are just kind of cold and weird. And Johnny's helped me realize like, it's not you. It's just 
<laughs> not everyone like it's not every not everyone's like you, you know, and not everyone's gonna like you because you're like that, and they're yeah, not, and they don't understand that, and and some people are like, why are you so bubbly or why are you so happy? And I'm like, man, if you only knew what I've been through and what's going on in here, mm. you know, but not everybody needs to know your story. They can prejudge all they want. And that's fine. I just kill them with kindness and stay true to myself. You know? Yeah. I can envision you walking backstage at a tour area at the Slayer crew. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of grumpy people on the road that just don't want to be messed with and bringing that mm -hmm. energy in. Either people love it or they're like, shut Who up. This? Yeah, shut exactly. Up. <laughs> shut up and exactly. leave me alone. I got work to do. Ugh. That, Pretty that, much. that type of vibe is definitely prevalent on the road. So I can see how you'd be like, what's wrong with these people? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I toured with St. Vitus for a little while and they're, oh, very, right they're very dour bands. So that was me. I was like, our, our European bus driver called me Wednesday. They'd be like, hello, top of the morning to you Wednesday, you know? <laughs> and so, because I always had the long black hair. Yeah. And so they're like, what's up with the Brothers Grimm back there talking about Dave and Mark. And because uh, they've been, they went to high school together you know, in the, early 70s started St. Vitus in 1979 and uh so I'm just this ray of sunshine just like so happy to be working for St. Vitus and they're just like Ugh, you know and then finally like months into touring and them seeing me bust my ass they finally like loosened up and we're like ah you're all right you know <laughs> what did, what did you do for like what did you do for St. Vitus for tour so you were on I, the road with St. Yeah. Vitus I did, I did merch and just helped John with uh, tour management stuff. So that was like right be, right when I moved to Fort Worth, I met um, a guy named John Perez. Um, he played guitar in Solitude Eternus, but he uh, tour managed them. And I met Wino and um, they basically like, I guess they were getting ripped off by somebody that was like doing their merch and TMing for them. And I had just gotten off the TV show and I was like really getting sucked into um not like the drama not drama but like you know I would see articles about the show and I'd read comments about myself and I'm like oh my god people are so hateful that goes back to what we were just talking about like how could people say that they don't know me you know and I I was really hurt by that and then they kept asking me to come back for all these other tv shows and I was like no way no deal you know because they just like they just try to destroy you you know like you see what happens to celebrities and tabloids and that's just not me you know I wasn't mm. my dad was like he didn't want me to go. And he's like, be careful. You stay true to who you are. If you go, you stay humble or I'm going to kick your ass. That's what he told me. So um, anyway, I got off topic topic again, but um, St. Vitus, St. Vitus is just a, uh, yeah, that was fun. So I got, I got kind of burnt out on tattooing because they're like, they destroy you on the show. They're just like so nitpicky. And you're just like, man, do I suck that bad? But it's all for ratings, you know? And so I got burnt out and then I immediately meet Wino and, their practice, uh, they wound up practicing at the house I lived in in Fort Worth. I had a, this big soundproof jam room. So all the guys would fly to the house and, you know, practice there and uh, bands were in and out of this house. And we had started the record store. And so it was like this big metal community up there. And they were like, man, we need someone to do merch. And I was like, man, I'm going to take off from tattooing for a couple of months. So I started working with them. And then eventually I worked with Wino uh, with Spirit Caravan when he did, um, he did a couple tours in 2014. And that's my favorite Wino project is Spirit Caravan. So that was really cool being able to tour and spend all that time with Sherman who just recently passed away. And that was like one of my closest friends on the road. So I'm really grateful. I got to spend all that time with him. And then um, a guy named Reed, it was just me and Reed was the whole road, road crew. And Reed is um, tech for corrosion. And he played in Wake, um, R-W-A-K-E. So Reed Rayley is his name. So Reed and I were like super close on those tours. And it's just like amazing, unforgettable moments that came into my life as a result of tattooing and, um, you know, being on the TV show and just different, just meeting certain people. I met Wino, but seeing, seeing Vitus and then just so happened. I was such a big fan. I was like, dude, fuck yeah, I'll work for you guys. So I got paid to see St. Vitus every night. It's amazing. <laughs> I, I love how much you love rock and roll and metal. Like oh, yeah. that, that really shone through from the second I met Brittany on the Kiss Cruise. She had this kind of like, it was like a captain's hat with the Kiss logo on. And I was like, you know, where do you get that hat? That's like my yeah. favorite hat I've ever yeah. seen. Like, oh, no, I made this like that. You can't buy them. And I was like, oh, man, um, you just have you always obviously you're saying your dad was a big classic rock head. Was your mum a music fan as well? And did you get music from both of them? And when did you start forging your own? taste or was your own taste literally a result of just what was passed on from them because it was that good 
well, a, a mixture of everything. So my dad was all like 70s hard rock, his favorite band Skinnerd. So I was like, Skinnerd's probably my favorite band just because I love the messaging. I love how simple and true. And I just love, um, I love the groove. Um, and I just love Southern rock. Uh, but my mom, she was all 80s hair metal. She loved Dawkin, White Snake, Motley Crue. My brother's first concert was Motley Crue when he was a kid. And she just loved all that shit. Um, Legs Diamond was a huge uh, fa favorite of my mom's. But then uh, that was like late 80s. 80s. I was born in 87. And so then when I was like around five and starting to like really like go crazy to records and stuff around the house, uh, like Alice in Chains and Soundgarden and Mother Love Bone, my mom's favorite band ever is Mother Love Bone. And so I have a pretty big love affair with Temple of the Dog and Soundgarden and just that whole just grunge and Alice, of, of course. I remember hearing um, again for the first time when Tripod came out, the third record. And I don't remember maybe that came out in 95, maybe. Um, but I was super young, seven or eight or something like that. And my mom was just playing it on repeat, that song, like da -da -da -da, like that, just that riff. I would just remember just like sitting in there and bobbing my head and being like, this is the greatest song I've ever heard. So seven or eight years old, listening to Alice in Chains on, on a five disc changer and just being like, play that song again, mom, play the song again. <laughs> And just saving up all my chore money to go buy CDs to fill up my booklet that it was just my youth. Like, <laughs> I, I just worship the tangible copy, you know? And so, like, we didn't have phones. We didn't have internet. It's the 90s, the early 90s, you know? So it's like, I would spend all my money going to Blockbuster to buy a couple CDs. So anything 90s I love. Um, I was like, I was a, you know, a radio rock kid because that's all I really knew besides what my mom and dad were giving me and my mom was into some deep cut stuff like she liked typo she loved typo so she was into some heavy stuff but um my dad kind of stopped at metallica he's like ah that and justice i don't know about all that you know that got a little <laughs> you know so <laughs> but my dad was more just like hard rock you know and so he was kind of like ah, i'm not really into all that boys and makeup and stuff so my dad didn't even really like kiss or anything like that he's like i don't know about boys strutting around in high heels he was just a gritty man you know what i mean and then my mom was like "Ooh, i love boys and makeup <laughs> yeah, so i got the best of both worlds so that was that was pretty cool and then i forged my own um love through uh you know deftones and tool and stuff like that that was huge when i was a kid i just loved i loved 90s shit like that and so I just saw Tool for the first time last year and I cried. I just remember like, I was like, oh my God, I haven't heard some of these songs since I was a kid and just playing mm -hmm. opiate over and over again on my walk home with my discman, you know, just brings back so many memories hearing these songs from my youth. So I love it all. Oh man, but, I, I got to tell you, opiate, you just mentioned that. What a record. Right? I, I think, you know, Tool is known as this very progressive band, but to me, that early shit is just still like wow yeah and, and and like there's not a bad song on on anima like are you kidding me like what a the early stuff um yep. so good i love how much you love music too because that's totally matt and i as well like i don't i don't really have much of an identity outside of music like, <laughs> i know me too because no matter what i do it's there whether i'm in nature or everything like if you come to my house nine times out of ten there's music playing. I just can't yep. not have music. Um, but I have to touch on this because I'm a huge fan as well. Why no? Can we just talk awesome. about real quick? Side note. Um, and I love Hidden Hand. I know it's not the popular. Yes, opinion, but yes. Hidden Hand was such a good project. But yes, I feel like he's kind of underrated, man. Like why no is he's like a, an Aussie almost to me in, in my Dude. eyes. I just don't think he got the recognition he deserved. So Wino is, hopefully he's going to be the next guest on our next podcast. So uh, you guys hear it first. Wino is, he's basically, he's family to me. When my dad died, he was, he was close with my dad. They're cut from the same cloth. They are the same dude. Uh, Wino just plays guitar and my dad plays drums. And so they're around the same age too. And so I started working for Wino. They met. Wino found out that my dad died and he and his girlfriend got in their car, brought his acoustic guitar, drove from New York to Texas and played my dad's memorial for free. I was like, I don't have the money to pay you. Why no? Like we're poor. We can't even afford to cremate him. And he was like, I loved your dad and I love you. I will be there. And he was wow. there. He showed up at the last minute. Boom. Johnny set up the PA and he played on a stage for 30 people. And I just bawled my eyes out. I mean, that's wow. the type of human being Wino is like being on the road with him. He is such a beautiful soul. Like 
I'm sure he's fucked up some some people over like I, I'll get messages when I post about him like oh how dare you fucking promote Wido and I'm like man you have your personal relationship with someone I have mine and he's never done me dirty he is he's awesome and his music has gotten me through so much in my life and just nobody would could ever take away the fact that he drove from New York to South Texas to play my dad's memorial in the middle of winter wow. and didn't ask for a dime and put a hat out for tips to get have gas money to get home he is like one of the wow. last of the guitar heroes like he's lemmy he he i mean he was on the probot record with lemmy and as you mentioned why no and so many people don't know who you're talking about i'm like how did this man not get the exposure but you may hear this come from his own mouth uh, i'm going to ask him about this on the podcast but when i toured with him i'm like why didn't the obsessed blow up because the obsessed was his first band early 80s but he goes because thrash took off because i'm a fucking thrasher i love metallica love slayer exodus all that shit and i'd always rock those shirts on the road and he'd be like metallica eh? and so he'd have like these deep talks about thrash and he was like he's like you know i gotta give it to you gotta give it to slayer at least like that shit was heavy but basically he said thrash came out and kind of overshadowed the obsessed because he really had something unique with his sound but thrash was fucking huge you can't top metallica or slayer or you know those early bay area bands and so he kind of got overshadowed and then um uh the fir- there's a crazy story about uh, the the first singer of St. Vitus and why he quit. Um, and then they wound up looking for another singer and why no tried out. And Dave was like, this guy will never sing for St. Vitus. If you've heard Dave's voice, <laughs> he's like, he's got a mullet. He does not, he's not going to sing for St. Vitus. And so on that first obsessed records, why no's all, you know, kind of motley crew looking, but he still looks hard, but it's the eighties, a weird time. And so anyway, he tried out and Dave was like, damn, this guy's good. Right. And so Sure enough, they got they got Wino and they did Born Too Late masterpiece. That's what's on my knuckles is Born Late, and um, V and all the Mournful Cries and all the other Wino records that people worship. And I love Scott Riegers too, the first singer. But I'm a Vitus fanatic. But anyway, it's just it's this crazy story about just like I worship Saint Vitus and Spirit Caravan was the first thing I ever heard, and I just I love this music. And it's almost like a lot of these things in my life that have happened, like I've almost manifested them through music and through the power of listening to those lyrics and really like feeling those songs. Like there's Wino songs that I like, I feel it in my soul. Like I'm just like oh my god, like I'll cry. Like I'm like fuck, dude. Like I'm in the middle of a drawing, and it's like, dude, this dude has so much passion. And he means what the hell he says, you know? And so just like meeting him and having like, uh, I have like a really spiritual connection with him because he's had so much loss and addiction and shit like that, that I, that's why I relate to his music so much is because of my mom's drug addiction mostly and St. Vitus and which Vitus is mostly Dave's lyrics. Um, but why no, just the way he presents it just with this anger and just, uh, just really got me through certain times in my life of my mom being an addict or my mom dying and being pissed at her for dying and shit like that. You know, that like music gets you through those things when you don't, you don't have someone and I can't, I'm not going to go spill my life story to a counselor that, may or may not care. I, I did once and I went to one counseling session, check, checked her watch. I was like, I'm out of here. I'd rather just go listen to records. You know what I mean? It, it, <laughs> it helps me more. I haven't found the right person maybe, but music, my point is music's just always gotten me through these traumatic life events and helped me so much in my life. So I, I, like you said, uh, there's always music playing because there's no life without music. In my opinion, mm-hmm. like it's stale. There is no life without music. So Dig that's it. how I feel. Yeah. Tell me about your connection to Kiss, because you're talking about heavy metal. Obviously, you know, Kiss is a different breed. And you <laughs> love Kiss, right? It's safe to say they're one of your... I love them a little <laughs> bit. I have them all tattooed on me. <laughs> yes. I, okay, so I got into Kiss, like, a little bit later in life. Like, I wasn't obsessed with them as a teen, because I was more into grunge as a teen and thrash and stuff. And so I got into them later in my teen years, and then... I saw the, the footage of the midnight special, I th- think is what it was. And they're doing black diamond. And I'm just, I was just like, this is the heaviest shit ever. It was like when I was getting in really getting heavy into doom, like electric wizard and Vitus and stuff like that. And they're just like, yo, like that, that end of black diamond where the ace just falls to his knees and they're just s- smoke everywhere. And I was like, Anyone that is into black metal that doesn't like kiss is a total poser. I'm sorry, but that is where all <laughs> black metal came from. <laughs> And so I like something clicked in me at that point. And I'm like, I bet Abbott is totally obsessed with Kiss. Later in life, I met Abbott 
because he saw my kiss tattoos and ran over to me and was like, I love kiss. I'm like, you're Abbott. Oh my God. You know, it was after a show and it's just, everyone loves kiss or hates kiss, but most people that hate kiss don't know how profound their impact on music has been in my opinion. And usually once I school them on that, they start liking kiss. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah you kind of look at every band that started in the 90s and they're all kids who grew up in the 70s you know yeah. wor worshiping at the altar of kiss and as you say they changed everything it was so cool seeing black diamond live on the boat that was a highlight dude and they played um what else did they play that freaked me out going blind i was like mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah. that's like yeah. one of my favorites melvin's yeah I, cover. I love the melvin's cover of that yes i tripped out on that yeah, like you said, the Kiss Cruise being a highlight of your life, just wow. I was like, why can't we just live on here? Can this just be our <laughs> life? <laughs> yeah, I thought that. I was like, don't make me get off. Don't make me go back to dry life no. in real life. I think you, you sent me a message at one point. You're like, in my mind, I'm still on the boat. I was yeah, like, me yeah. too. I'm floating. <laughs> yeah, it was the best time. The best time. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm grateful okay. that that cruise brought us together and we got to meet yes. on there. And and led Me to too. this amazing chat and um, yes. just super inspirational stuff. I want to get some some plugs out there. So you've obviously got your podcast, The Haunted Chapel. Um, how do people find out more about the tables in particular? Because I think that a lot of our listeners would be extremely interested to, to learn more about those. Yeah. So uh, my tables are all, I am I make them all. So on um, my Instagram for the tables uh, specifically is just at heavy metal tables, all one word. And I make everything myself. And so it takes me a little bit of time here or there, but I, I always take custom orders. And so you can just go to thehauntedchapel.com and um, there should be a note to be able to email me on there or like a, a link to email me or my my personal website is just bztattoo, B-Z-T-A-T-T-O-O.com. -T um, and so you can just like drop me a line and email me and I do everything myself. I don't have an assistant. I book all my own appointments, do all my own drawings, make all the tables. I do everything. I'm like Wonder Woman. I just need a cape. But um, so Hustler. just give me, yes, I'm just always hustling. And so, cause you just got to, carve your own path in this life, you know? So, uh, just drop me a line, uh, bztattoo.com and I will respond as soon as I can. It may take me a day or two, but I will respond to you. And yeah, if you want to get tattooed the same, the same way. And I've got a really killer giveaway going on right now for a huge, uh, black Sabbath table I made. That's really amazing. So you could, you just donate 20 bucks and I send you a bunch of free stickers and stuff like that. So it's, you're getting stuff for your money and then, uh, you get a ticket in the pot to possibly win this table. So, it's amazing as well. I've seen a photo of that one. It's a beautiful yeah. piece. Massive as well. Yes, it's huge. I'm going to take a picture next to it because a friend of mine came over and was like, I had no idea it was this big. He was like, scale. you need to take a, <laughs> yeah, he's like, you're tiny. You need to take a picture by it. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> I'll lay on it. <laughs> now I've but got to good. say as, as somebody who's spent my whole life trying to like, you know, independently, you know, manifest a living from doing what you love. I, I know how hard it is. Uh, and I just, I really admire your success, especially everything you've been through, you know, on a personal level makes it all the more incredible. Um, and you just, you know, you clearly live in your, your best life as the kids like to say, doing what you love. And it's, you know, it's evident that you work your ass to the bone and you love it. And yeah, yeah I just think the world that you've created for yourself is really cool, really magical. And, and I love to see it. Thank you so much. And we never got to that Paul Stanley story, but um, we can get to that another time. But thank you, Paul Stanley, for shaping my life, basically. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Why, why don't why don't you end by telling us the, you know, the real version of what you told Paul? I kind of botched it at the start, but what no. you said was far more touching. Oh. Well, I'm a little ADHD and I'm like um, a little long winded. So I'll go from one thing to another without getting to the point. But uh, long story short, my mom had tattoos and my dad didn't. And I was always kind of curious about that. And she had a rose on her chest. It was really nice. And she was really modest. So she would kind of like cover up, but I'd try to look at it. And um, later in life, you know, I saw Paul Stanley's rose and I'm like, that's like mom's. And my mom's like, yeah, you know, I went to my mom told me she she ran away hitchhiked at age 15 in 1979 she just was like i'm out of here mom hitchhiked to san francisco and got tattooed by lyle tuttle who was the guy that did paul stanley's tattoo so wow. he actually did my mom's 
Rose tattoo as well. And so years later, she told me this and I just became obsessed with tattoos. So I just started looking at, you know, basically like circus magazines and like the music circus magazines and seeing like all the rock stars with tattoos, Stevie Ray Vaughan and all the 80s hair metal guys and Tracy Guns and all these guys that are all tattooed up and rockered out. I'm like, I want to look like that, mom. She's like, you can don't tell your dad, you know, because my dad didn't like tattoos. And so years later, you know, see it just seeing Paul Stanley still with that rose it just always reminded me of my mom and seeing that tattoo on my mom's chest and just trying to pull down her shirt and be like what's that mom and then she told me it was done by the same person so when I had the chance to ask Paul a question I was like I don't even know what to ask Paul what do you ask Paul Stanley I was just like just thank you for being you basically and because he was just such an outlaw in that time getting tattooed in the 70s my mom was like hell yeah I want to be an outlaw too which made me be an outlaw so and just carve my own path and I think Paul Stanley is such a huge inspiration to me because a he's an artist and he's just like he's so successful and he doesn't have to keep pushing himself to paint and make art and make wine and do all these awesome things but he does because he's Paul Stanley and he can do whatever he wants and he uses his resources properly because people just love and appreciate and respect him. And he's so multi-talented that like on the Kiss Cruise and when he had that art gallery, I, I just couldn't even believe it. I was like, I was mesmerized at the body of work that this man has. I'm like, this is Paul Stanley from Kiss and he has hundreds of paintings. Like what an incredible human, you know? So that inspires me to just constantly create like tattooing's not enough. I had to start doing something else because everyone tattoos now. So I started making the tables and now people are starting to rip me off of that. And I'm like, hmm, what am I going to make next? You know, it's like always pushing myself to the next level. So well, imitation, as they say, is the highest form of flattery. So yeah. if people are copying what you're doing, it shows that you're doing something right. I hope so. I'll take it as a compliment. <laughs> I respect the hustle and your resilience, uh, just your spirit in general. I think it's, uh, if nothing else, you know, people will hear the story and be inspired by the fact that the way you carry yourself and your your intention seems very pure. And I, I enjoy that about people's spirits. I always try to see the best in humanity. You know, it's easy to sort of like collapse and, and give in to the negativity that surrounds yeah. us on a daily basis. Um, but I've made it my life's mission to constantly try to push forward and be positive. And I can see that um, we are kindred spirits as far as that goes. I can see that Matt is very much the same way, too. Yes. I, I enjoy that type of energy because it makes me feel less alone in this world. You know, I'm a hopeless optimistic. And it's really nice to hear your story and to see that, you know, you're just putting out work, whether it be tattoos or the tables. And that inspires me because I tend to get a little lazy and sort of like go within myself and I need days to recover and all that. But um, just in general, very inspiring stuff. And I commend you for that. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there are people who have listened to maybe have been through similar or a worse or even less than that will be inspired regardless, because it's all about everybody's got a story, the human condition. And uh, yours was just it touched me. It was awesome. And your energy is in general is is awesome. So. Aww. Thank you guys. Much respect. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm a little long-winded, but thank you for listening. This was fun. <laughs> you no, when you're no, you're not long-winded. You're just um got a lot to say. Yeah, and you're detail-oriented and that makes our job easy. It's fine. Like it's a good conversation. That's that's what it's all about. Just that reciprocation and just letting you tell your story. That's why you're here. Awesome. You guys are great. I've been listening to the podcast and I love it. Oh, awesome. Thank you. We rated it and we subscribed. Hell yeah. Oh, five stars. <laughs> You're awesome, Brittany. I'm really yes, glad Rob. that we met and I'm really happy Me that we too. got to make this happen. And uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you on land or sea yes. very soon, I hope. It'll happen. Um, yeah, take care and uh, keep being you. I will. Thank you guys so much. Pleasure. Metal forever. Oh, yes. <laughs> take Bye, care. Bye, guys. Thank you.